headlines of VTV News. Maintaining the party's working class nature. Sacrifices contribute to Diet Bin Phu campaign's glorious victory. And later on in our world news, IMF raises growth forecast for Asia Pacific. Broadcasting from Hanoi, the capital of Vietnam, VTV News starts right now. Hello and welcome to VTV News, coming live to you from Hanoi. You with me, Lina Phạm, and here's the top news of the hour. Prime Minister Phạm Minh Ching on Wednesday extended condolences to families of victims of a boiler explosion in Dong Nai province, which killed six people and injured many others. He requested relevant agencies to provide support to the victims' families and care for the injured. He also requested an investigation into the cause of the explosion and the safety measures taken at the factory to ensure incidents like this will not happen again. The Prime Minister also requested more efforts be put into spreading safety information to both businesses and workers. Since its establishment, the Communist Party of Vietnam has consistently emphasized the vital importance of preserving and fortifying the essence of the working class. This belief is crucial for the party's development, advancement, and ultimately the victory of the revolutionary cause. Over its 94-year journey, this steadfast ideology has endured and flourished. It is evidenced by the unwavering assurance of this pivotal constituency within the party's leadership framework. In late March, 36 union officers and workers from industrial zones in Haiphong City were officially inducted as members of the Communist Party of Vietnam. The party consistently prioritizes the expansion of party membership among workers. Since the commencement of the 13th Party Congress term, Approximately 8,000 workers have been inducted as party members. General Secretary Nguyen Phu Trump underscored that the advancement of party membership within the working class is not solely about numerical expansion, but rather it hinges on fortifying the ideological foundation of the working class. Regardless of changing circumstances, this ideological essence remains steadfast in the current context. After nearly 40 years of innovation, the Vietnamese working class has experienced sustained growth in both numbers and competence. It is now pervasive across all industries, professions and economic domains. The documents of the 13th Party Congress explicitly advocate for the development of the working class in terms of both quantity and quality. We know that the working class is the pioneers in innovation to increase labor productivity and improve working conditions. It serves as the force driving the country's industrialization and modernization under the fourth industrial revolution. It is imperative to nurture the working class through preservation and ongoing development efforts. At the recent 13th Vietnam National Trade Unions Congress, General Secretary Nguyen Phu Trang noted that it is necessary to raise awareness, qualifications and professional skills to build an increasingly strong and modern Vietnamese working class. We must perfect the legal framework to improve workers' qualifications and contributions. We also need to improve vocational training and education continue political and ideological education, deploy trade union activities, and raise workers' responsibility to the country and society. The working class has made significant contributions to the struggle for national liberation and development. General Secretary Nguyen Phu Chau has emphasized that ensuring the Vietnamese working class remains modern, robust and responsive to contemporary demands is a collective responsibility shared by the party, the political system and the entire society. 
More than 60,000 people from across the nation visited Ho Chi Minh Mausoleum in Hanoi during the five-day holiday. They visited the budding historical and cultural relic site, the Ho Chi Minh Relic Site at the Presidential Palace, the Ho Chi Minh Museum, and the Memorial Monuments of War Martyrs and Heroes. The outdoor temperature reached more than 40 degrees Celsius, but more and more people flocked to Ho Chi Minh Mausoleum during the five-day holiday. Having traveled nearly 2,000 kilometers from Cà Mau to the capital city, this veteran finally had the opportunity to fulfill his wish. I have cherished this for decades, so today being able to visit Ho Chi Minh's mausoleum, I do so with great pride. Our group left at 5 a.m. from Hoa Binh province. We want to visit Ho Chi Minh's mausoleum so we can talk about him and pass down for the young generations. To ensure the health of people visiting the mausoleum on recent days of intense heat, the management board of Ho Chi Minh's mausoleum has prepared free cakes and drinks for people, including milk for children. Students volunteer to support citizens and tourists. I hope that I could support other visitors. Being able to contribute and support everyone makes me feel very proud. During the holiday, there were nearly 46,000 domestic and foreign tourists coming to the mausoleum to pay their respects to late President Ho Chi Minh. On April 30, there were 19,000 visitors. We come to Vietnam with a desire to learn about history and culture. When I come here and witness the people's affection for President Ho Chi Minh, I feel his great role for the people. President Ho Chi Minh is closely associated with Vietnamese history. Every major national holiday, millions of Vietnamese come to Ho Chi Minh Mausoleum to remember his marriage and the previous generations who sacrificed and fought for the independence and freedoms of the country. During the Reunification Day holiday this year, people from all over the country visited Kim Lien Special National Relic Area, Nam Dan District, Nghệ An, to express their gratitude to beloved President Ho Chi Minh. The intense hot weather over the past few days could not stop people from flocking to Uncle Ho's home village. During this year's holiday, the relic site welcomed nearly 63,000 people 45 times more than usual. On April the 30th alone, the relic site welcomed more than 20,000 people. On May the 1st, 1954, the final attack of the Diet Bien Phu campaign began. The historic victory relied on the sacrifices of so many people associated with fierce battles at locations A1, D1, C1, C2, and E1. Independence and freedom relied on the unrelenting dedication and unforgettable sacrifices of so many. Him Lam Hill is where the opening attack of the Diem Bien Phu campaign took place. The military order, we must win the first battle, inspired soldiers to smash defensive points of the French army. Mother Fading Zot used his body to fill this hole so that his teammates captured Him Lam base after only six hours. At that time, there were three machine guns in that bunker that shot straight. Funding Zot was injured, but he put himself in the line of fire by using his own body to fill the hole. After 56 days, each captured base meant bloody battles and lost lives. There were sacrifices even before the campaign began. The artillery was about to fall into the abyss. Tho Vĩnh Diện shouted, Comrades, save the artillery! And at the same time, he used his own body to save the artillery. There are still many examples of sacrifices of young volunteers and frontline workers. It's not easy to defuse bombs. Defusing bombs like this is leading down the road to death. So it requires brave brothers. We did not fear death and volunteered to go to the front line. All of us sat in a circle and, and placed a bulb incense in the middle. 
We pray for ourselves in silence, and then we all stood up to go. Everyone who visits the Inbin province wants to come to National Mothers Cemetery A1. The Inbin province has three national cemeteries, the resting place of those who died in the Diet Bin Phu campaign. Most of the graves here have not been identified, but their names will always be the heralded names of the country. Some of them joined the regiment in the afternoon and died in the evening. I don't even know their names or faces. So many of them are nameless, martyrs, national heroes. This sign is placed close to the bomb crater on top of A1 Hill. Independence and freedom today are exchanged by unforgettable sacrifices. Coming up next, workers on shift for Long Tang Airport construction during holidays. And central localities share water sources. When it comes to business, it's crucial to choose a smart location with global impact. And Vietnam might just be the location for you. Connect worldwide to advanced logistics networks. Smart Hub for technology and innovation. A dynamic business ecosystem. An environment with a competitive edge. Welcome back to VTV News. Throughout the Reunification Day and Labor Day holidays, thousands of officers, engineers and construction staff worked at the Long Tang Airport construction site. Thanks to their efforts, the construction progress of the airport is advancing smoothly. During this holiday period, contractors have mobilized nearly 5,000 officers, engineers and workers, along with various equipment and machinery to execute various project packages. The construction site is actively engaged in several key packages, including the Lam Thang Airport passenger terminal, the runway, taxiway and apron, and the construction of roads T1 and T2, connecting to the airport. We hope for a more decisive approach from the authorities in promptly handing over additional land areas, thereby ensuring project progress. Workers are being allocated appropriate work schedule to maintain productivity while adhering to prescribed regulations. With the rainy season forecasted to commence in one month in Dong Nai province, contractors are intensifying efforts to accelerate progress on project components. With good preparation, the contractors have prepared domestic materials and gathered them at the construction site. As for imported materials, we have submitted them for approval to ensure progress. The Lam Thang International Airport project spans 5,000 hectares and anticipates a total investment of nearly 13.3 billion U.S. dollars. Phase one of the project entails constructing a runway, passenger terminal and facilities to accommodate 25 million passengers annually, with an estimated completion date in 2026. The Central and Central Highlands region has been experiencing an unprecedented heat wave in recent days, resulting in drought and severe water shortages. While the allocation of water resources among areas along the lower Vuza Tubon River has not yet escalated to a critical level, it has emerged as a pressing concern amid the current extreme weather conditions. This is the confluence between Vuza River and Guanghui River. During the dry season, this water source provides daily water for nearly one million people in Danang City and tens of thousands of hectares of crops in four districts and cities of Guangnam Province. Therefore, the construction of a temporary dam to redirect water to Vuza River is currently under negotiation and consideration. 
We request that the dam be built so that water return into Da Nang at Anchak Station, which is a height of 1.6 to 2 meters to ensure a safe water supply for Da Nang this dry season. The consensus among the authorities and local communities regarding the sharing of water resources is commendable. This measure aims to maintain a balanced flow and prevent issues such as erosion. The temporary dam blocking has been deployed many times by Quảng Nam Province and Da Nang City authorities. However, this is still only a temporary solution. Currently, two localities are proposing to the government and the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development to reevaluate flow fluctuations to have a sustainable ratio between the two localities. The sharing of water resources between Quảng Nam Province and Da Nang City underscores the imperative of prioritizing water security. It emphasizes the necessity for effective collaboration to responsibly manage and distribute this invaluable resource. A weak cold spell hit northern localities of Vietnam on May the 1st, helping to reduce the intense heat in early summer that has baked the northern and central regions for the past few days. As the cold front moves further inland, it will bring rain, causing temperatures to tumble sharply. It is forecast that hot weather tomorrow will only continue in the localities from Quảng Bình to Phú Yên. The highest temperature is commonly 35 to 38 degrees Celsius in some places, above 39 degrees Celsius. The central highlands and southern regions will continue to be sunny. The common temperature in the central highlands is 35 to 36 degrees Celsius, with some places over 37. In the southern region, it is extremely hot, with temperatures of 35 to 38 degrees Celsius, with some places reaching over 39 degrees Celsius. The forest fire which broke out on Tuesday in Nam Thai Khamin, Nam Dan District, Nghệ An Province was brought under control on a Wednesday after hours battling the blaze. The provincial authorities and functional forces are still carrying out patrols to review the potential risk of another fire. Currently, the forest fire risk in Nghệ An Province has reached an extremely dangerous level. Many checkpoints were set up to warn people who work in the forest to prevent another fire. May the 1st is International Workers' Day, also known as the Day of Action for the International Labor Movement and Workers. Care activities are organized worldwide to acknowledge the contributions of workers to their country's development. Taking care of workers is not only the responsibility of trade unions at all levels, but also of enterprises. The greatest desire for most workers is a safe working environment and a fair income to support their families. Although Saw and her husband are originally from Lai Chau province, they have been working in Bắc Ninh for over three years. They work during the day and return to their rental home at night. They minimize all expenses to maximize their savings. My income currently ranges from 276 to 315 U.S. dollars per month. It's challenging to live on this income and still send money back home. The average wage of workers in industrial zones currently ranges from 276 U.S. dollars to 394 U.S. dollars per month. In families where both spouses work, all expenses must be minimized so they can send money back home to support their family. After a challenging year, their primary hope is for more job opportunities and improved income. We have to save up to care for our children. For example, we walk instead of driving to the company to save some money. Trade unions at all levels are responsible for protecting workers' benefits. Many care activities have also been held in May, the labor month. There are greater benefits in the agreement than those stated in the laws. This satisfies the workers and is also within the financial capabilities of enterprises. It has mutual benefits for both employees and employers. 
We strive to remove obstacles for enterprises and propose that they implement welfare program to improve the living standards of workers. This way, they become more committed to the enterprises and the labor confederation. Welfare initiatives are organized by both enterprises and trade unions. These initiatives include health checkups, medication distribution, and visits and gifts. In many enterprises, trade unions proactively negotiate with employers to retain jobs, avoid layoffs, and ensure wages and bonuses on holidays. The Ponagar Festival, the largest traditional folk festival in Khanghua province, takes place on the holiday of April the 30th and May the 1st. The value of heritage is consistently affirmed through this festival. It serves as a symbol of solidarity, attracting participation from both King and Cham people. Leaving the Cham villages in Ning Thuan and Bing Thuan provinces in the middle of the night, Many Cham families arrive at the Punaga Tower in Yachang by sunrise. The entire Cham village gather around the ancient tower, practicing sacrificial rituals passed down from ancient times. The Punaga Tower originally belonged to the Cham people, so every year the Cham people from across the country come here to worship. Also at the festival, King people come to the Pugnaga Tower to perform a shadow dance ritual imbued with folk believed to worship Mother Tianyana, the practices of the King people who worship the Mother Goddess, and the Cham people who worship Mother Tianyana occur in the same place, the Pugnaga Tower. Researchers confirm that this is a religious symbolism, a harmony of belief, thereby creating an exemplary, unique Pugnaga festival. Ponagar Tower is a cultural, spiritual, and belief connection, especially the mother worship customs of both King and Cham people. Since 2012, the Ponagar Festival has been recognized as a national intangible cultural heritage. This year, more than 100 groups of pilgrims have come to the Ponagar Tower. The number of people and tourists participating in the festival has also increased because it coincides with the holiday. Above all, the appeal of the Punagat Tapad festival lies in its cultural depth. The Cham people are open to absorbing the king's culture. The king people are open to absorbing the Cham's culture. So this festival is a cultural mix and demonstrates cultural tolerance. The Punagat festival is a gathering place for cultural diversity of ethnic communities in the South Central and Central Highlands. People come here to pray for peace in the country through unique rituals. Coming up next in our world news, IMF raises growth forecasts for Asia-Pacific. And Japan plans seaweed to meet its climate goals. The International Monetary Fund IMF on Wednesday released the Asia-Pacific Econ Economic Outlook Report for 2024, which emphasized that the region's economic growth is in a stable phase and has very diverse development potential. The IMF raised its regional growth forecast this year to 4.5 percent, an increase of 0.3 percentage points compared to the forecast made six months ago. Emerging economies in Asia largely contribute to this positive growth trend with India, Mongolia, the Philippines, Cambodia and Vietnam leading the way. According to the IMF, in addition to challenges such as population aging and slowing productivity growth, the Asian region still has a need to invest in capital, digital infrastructure and workforce skills. At least 19 people were killed and dozens were injured on Wednesday after part of a highway in Guangdong province, China, collapsed. According to a video shared on social networks, fire and smoke rose from a deep hole and it appeared that many cars had fallen into it. Police blocked part of the highway and asked drivers to take alternate routes. About 500 people participated in the rescue work. Authorities are investigating the cause of the incident, Guangdong province suffered a series of extreme weather phenomena, including severe floods and deadly tornadoes, likely the root of the problem with the broken down motorways. 
The European Union on Wednesday opened an investigation into the social networking platforms of Facebook and Instagram of a technology group Meta due to suspicions that these platforms do not fully implement anti-fake news measures. The EU said that the investigation aims to prevent the exploitation of Instagram and Facebook vulnerabilities due to foreign interference. The EU's concerns about the harmful effects of defect technology are are increasing, especially the risk of misinformation about the European Parliament elections scheduled to take place from June the 6th to the 9th. The EU has recently called on technology companies to prevent fake images, videos and other content generated by artificial intelligence. On a recent Saturday, some 100 volunteers gathered on a popular beach in the Japanese port city of Yokohama, wading in the shallows to plant strands of light green eelgrass on the seabed. What began as a project to restore the natural ecosystem along the coast of the city just south of Tokyo has taken on national importance, helping fight climate change as Japan aims to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. These volunteers aren't simply out for a stroll along this popular beach in Yokohama. They're hoping to fight climate change with these clumps of ill grass, wrapping them in clay and planting them among the waves. The group wants to try and help restore Japan's ecosystem and in turn help achieve Japan's goal of going carbon neutral by 2050. There was a lot of eelgrass here, but as the land was reclaimed it died off. So since about 2000 we've been working to bring back the eelgrass that used to grow here in this seaside park. Japan's Ministry of the Environment estimates that in 2022, the amount of blue carbon, which is carbon naturally stored by marine and coastal ecosystems, was roughly 350,000 tons. This is around 0.03% of the 1.135 billion tons of CO2 equivalent greenhouse gases Japan emitted that year. If eelgrass were to grow in every shallow area of the sea it's possible for it to grow, I think it could absorb perhaps 10 or 20 percent of human emissions. As things currently stand, it can take in maybe a few percent at most so it's not going to have a major impact as a measure against global warming. According to the Environment Ministry data, Japan's seagrass and seaweed beds have shrunk, making the task of reforesting the seafloor even more challenging. They are now only estimated to cover less than 200,000 hectares, or around half a million acres. And now let's take a look at the weather forecast. And that's it for this edition of VTV News. Thank you very much for watching. To rewatch our program, you can download VTV Go from App Store or Google Play or tune in our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash VTV4Go. Goodbye for now.